Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Hewell Hauser, and we're getting ready to take a look at sports history here in Southern California. And you'd think that a logical place for us to at least begin this adventure would be here at the world-famous Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. A lot of sports history has been made here at the Coliseum. But the truth of the matter is, we're not spending any time at the Coliseum at all. We're getting ready to leave this place and go a couple of miles across town and spend the whole day inside another historic Los Angeles location. A place that you probably think has nothing to do with sports at all. But believe me, it does. And here we are at the Central Library in downtown LA. This is where we're gonna spend the whole day in search of the history of sports in Southern California. And now we're gonna find out just exactly why we are spending the day inside this wonderful library. Here to kind of start us off is Carolyn Cozo Cole, who's an old friend of mine and who, who is also the curator of the photo collection here at the LA Public Library. Carolyn, why are we here? Although I have a feeling that this kind of gives it away right here. It does, but I wanted you to come down and see this fabulous exhibit. It has not been done anywhere in Southern California like this. It's a real first, and it's something that has converted non-sports people into sports um, lovers. All right, now what it says here, a century of LA sports photography, 1889 to 1989. So these sports pictures came out of this huge collection of photographs. Most people think of the library as a place to go get books, but you've got pictures here too, don't you? We have an amazing collection. We have almost three million photographs, 60,000 of them online, so that people can you know, get them from their home, whether it's in Timbuktu or here. And um, these are incredible photographs. Where did they come from? How did you get well, them? In the early 80s, the library received the Security Pacific Collection, about 400,000, fabulous, turn of the century on up, the real history of downtown and the rest of early um, L.A. And then in 1989, the, or right after the Herald Examiner closed, they gave us their collection of oh, 2.5 wow. million photographs. So you've got a lot of pictures here in the library. It's and the this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, but it's very interesting because it deals exclusively with sports. We, I kept stumbling over sports photos over the years, you know, after doing so many exhibits, and I kept thinking, ah, you know, someday somebody will do this. And then a friend introduced me to David, and he was a sports writer and a really good one. That's a perfect uh, introduction yes. to this guy Go over ahead. here, because he's the guy, and we'll leave you behind and start our tour. Okay. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy yourself. You're the guy who literally, what did they do? Hand you 5,000 shoeboxes full of photographs and say, curate this? Basically, uh, it's a dream job, what can I say? Really, you did just get just files and boxes full of, were they all sports photographs? Actually, no, they weren't. They're all mixed together, but uh, was able to go through them uh, box by box and just look for all the great sports images, and uh, they jumped right out at me. Wow, look, we've got this whole gallery up here on the second floor and two more galleries down on the first floor full of this amazing collection. This is going to be a hard decision as to which ones we even talk about today, but there's some that, that kind of just jump right out at you, sure. like this one. Sure. Right here. Sure. Well, there's the, the Bambino, Babe Ruth, of course, in, in the prime of his, uh, of his career. And it's, it's just a neat shot. Here he's, as you can see, being greeted by uh, a bevy of starlets at Union Station. And, you know, Babe Ruth was so popular, probably in the 20s, nobody, no other athlete was photographed as, as often as Babe Ruth was. And 
you know, the Hollywood uh, producers wanted to take advantage of his popularity. So this was Babe Ruth in Hollywood coming out here to make it big in the movies. Did he ever may I don't remember ever seeing him in a movie. Well, he made several forgettable movies, but uh, but he his presence was there and and uh, the Ho Hollywood made a few films with him. And probably made a big to do over him when he came out here. This was in 1928 yeah. getting off the train. Exactly. And and at the time as, as you well know, Major League Baseball did not go beyond, let's say, St. Louis, and there was no television. So this was an opportunity, not just in terms of filming this movie, but he would sometimes in the off season uh, bring out a team and play in Los Angeles, and obviously the fans would flock to see him uh, because he was such a big gate attraction at the time. I'm looking right over your shoulder. Here's another one of these. Uh, you know, this is th this fellow is an, an icon here in Southern California. And we've got four photographs of him here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, well, this is Jackie Robinson, as if he needed an introduction. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, arguably the most important sports figure in Los Angeles history. And he moved with his family when he was about two from Georgia to Pasadena. Um, as you can see on the lower uh, photograph, he's with Pasadena Junior College. Uh, he's playing uh, baseball in that uh, in that photograph, but but Jackie was an amazing all-round athlete. Um, here he is on the UCLA football team, um, and another great uh, Kenny Washington is the one on the far right. Here's Jackie down here. Exactly, and then uh, are these it, in sequence. This is this, this is, is him as a basketball player yeah, over here. That's uh, him at UCLA again as a basketball player. Um, again, just considered he he is UCLA's own uh, first four letterman. And he also ran some track and field, of course. Very fast runner. His brother was a uh, Mac Robinson, competed in the 1936 Olympics. And here he is with his wife, obviously. No, uh, actually, no, that's that's him with Ruby D, the actress. Oh. Yeah. When he uh, after he made it with the Brooklyn Dodgers and integrated baseball, they Hollywood came calling and wanted him to make his movie, The Life Story, and they picked him to be the star. I'm looking right over here, <laughs> President Nixon and Gene. Autry. Yeah. That's a great picture because both of them were huge baseball nuts, weren't they? They were fanatics. Exactly. And uh, of course, Autry in early 60s purchased uh, the right to own the American League Los Angeles Angels. They actually played in Dodger Stadium for a while until he was able to build the stadium in Orange County in Anaheim. And there's his uh, good buddy, Richard Nixon, who at that time had a little time on his hands. <laughs> now, I've seen this picture, and I remember when it happened in 1976. This is probably one of the most famous Dodger baseball pictures here in Dodger Stadium. Absolutely. Uh, 1976, bicentennial year, um, two fans who you see on the right. Uh, jumped onto the outfield and started to light the American flag on fire. And uh, as you can see, that's actually Chicago Cubs outfielder Rick Monday. He, he was in the outfield. He swoops in and rescues the flag. And the staff photographer for the Herald Examiner, a, a gentleman named James Rourke, snapped that uh, just extraordinary moment and uh, it was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And it really was an example of how, especially in the 70s, with the strong feelings there were in this country then, the way sports and politics and patriotism all kind of blended and melded together. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's true. I mean, that was that certainly coming out of the 60s when, when activism and civil rights movement and, and other uh, social movements were happening. It, it extended into the 70s. And this story has a bittersweet ending. The, the sweet ending is that Rick Monday was eventually traded to the Dodgers, and he's now one of their broadcasters. The bitter ending is that the photographer, unfortunately, was murdered and is no longer uh, with us. Wow, see, yeah. every one of these pictures, I mean, well, there's so many different levels of stories. Exactly. Look at this one. Yeah. There he is, Sinatra, old blue eyes with Tommy Lasorda. There's a twosome right there. Yeah, a couple of, a couple of buddies, paisanos uh, together, and, uh, <laughs> and Lasorda, and you can see the photos behind them. That was Lasorda's office when he was manager for all those years with the Dodgers. Lots of 
of celebrity pictures on his wall. Exactly. Was and Sinatra a baseball fan, or do you think he was just there because of Lasorda? A, a little of both. He used to. He's been photographed with the Dodger hat quite a bit, but he also, with Lasorda, because they were friends, he would sing the national anthem a couple of times uh, over the course of Lasorda's career. Can you imagine being in Dodger Stadium and hearing Frank Sinatra sing the national anthem? What a moment. That would be just so neat. Football. And here is a photograph of a fellow who has a very dubious <laughs> distinction. Absolutely. Uh, one of the most famous nicknames in sport. But you're right. Unfortunately, it wasn't for a, a, a great moment. but. A very famous moment, 1929 Rose Bowl, uh, Cal versus Georgia Tech, and here you see Roy Regals uh, from Cal, and unfortunately he's running the wrong way with the ball. And he was given that name, wrong way. Regals, exactly. Regals. And that stuck with him uh, uh, for the rest of his Did life. Did he score a touchdown for the wrong team? Is actually, that what he ended up doing? Actually, um, a teammate tackled him very close to the goal line on the other end, and and yet uh, they never got out of that hole and Cal lost that game. And you were telling me that this is a good picture too of one of, this is an early action sports photograph. Exactly, um, certainly back in the 1910, 1920s, most of the sports photography around was portraits or posed shots. You rarely got that action shot. I mean, the technology just wasn't good enough then. So here you have both a, both a beautiful image, but also the key play of the game, and that's the key of this photo. Nowadays, we're, we're so used to seeing the, all the images of you know, the, the winning home run or the winning uh, uh, touchdown. Uh, very rarely did it happen back then. And unfortunately for Roy Regals, this photograph was probably on the front page of every sports <laughs> page in America that Sunday. Exactly, <laughs> and, and certainly it also talks to just how it helped make the Rose Bowl, because it was such a unique and different play, it helped make the Rose Bowl what it is today, such an institution and nationally known. All right, now we're looking down here. This is an interesting photograph here of the Fearsome Foursome, 1967. That's correct. Uh, this was the, the defensive line for the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, and we're talking about two people who stand out immediately here. Yep. Uh, Merlin Olson, who of course later became a big TV star, Little House on the Prairie, and Rosie Greer, um, another great football player and also known in Los Angeles history circles as he was the bodyguard for Robert Kennedy and the night when that he, he was, was assassinated, assassinated. The ambassador. Yeah, he helped uh, wrestle the gun away from uh, Sirhan Sirhan. And see, isn't it interesting when you see the photograph of these guys this is one chapter of their lives. Exactly. And then to see how their lives evolved and changed later on, it's interesting to see them back in this snapshot in time. Exactly. That's and what makes a lot of these interesting, isn't it? Exactly. I think Los Angeles is, is unique in that way because a lot of these players, like, let's say, Merlin Olsen, would go on to have a career in entertainment and television. You won't have that if you're, if you're playing in Cleveland or St. Louis, but if you're in Los Angeles and, and you get to be uh, connected with the entertainment world and media. You can be discovered. You can be discovered, exactly. And Merlin certainly was, and he was a great, all of these gentlemen were just great players. This is an interesting combination of three photographs. I guess starting in time, it goes back here to 1894 Los Angeles High School's football team. Yep, one of the, one of the first uh, teams in, in high school football. And uh, you'll see on the progression of these photos, both the way uh, the bodies changed and the padding changed, the equipment changed. So this is the second one, Bell Varsity. Bell Varsity. Of 1940, and there's a famous yeah. L.A. political figure in there. Absolutely. If you look right over there, that's uh, John Ferraro, who, of course, uh, one of the most important and influential politicians in Los Angeles history. Now, why do we have, now this is very interesting. We're juxtapositioning this with Crenshaw High's offensive line in 1985. Right. And There's some big guys there. Exactly. And uh, as the caption says, these are five 300 pounders. And it just shows how football has evolved, yeah. uh, both in equipment and in body type. And, and of course, in terms of race, I mean, these are all, two teams composed completely of white fellas, 
and here you have the, the start and the integration of, of uh, Los Angeles public schools. What a picture from the LA Marathon 1988, Bob Weiland? Bob Weiland, yep. Weiland. Yep, uh, a Vietnam veteran. He, he lost, as you can see, he, lo he lost his legs in, in the war in an explosion. Uh, this, is, this was this 1988, this, the, the marathon started in 86 here in Los Angeles and as you can see with, with how he got around. Oh wow, this is him arms. breaking the finish line. Exactly. And he he did the whole marathon. Yeah, 26.2 miles propelled by his arms and, and just his spirit. And wow. there have been a lot of inspirational stories of people who've run the LA Marathon, but probably none as inspirational as this one. Lisa Leslie, a triple Olympic gold medal winner, but this picture was made back before, this was in 1989 when she was still in high school. Yeah, Morningside High, uh, obviously practicing her jump shot that uh, propelled her to Olympic glory, and she plays for the LA Sparks today, and uh, just one of the great all-time athletes, and also points to the fact that Los Angeles has produced over the years some great female athletes, uh, you know, all the way back to Mae Sutton in tennis to uh, some of the, you know, Babe Didrikson winning in the Olympics in 1932. And, and then here you see Lisa Leslie extending that legacy. You like the pictures, the early pictures before they were famous, don't exactly. you? Exactly. I it, like this one. Lou Alcindor, 1969, at his graduation at UCLA, and I love this shot. He's 7'2", and, and the, the other people in line are much shorter. Yeah, That yeah. says it all right there, doesn't it? Exactly, and uh, obviously just an amazing uh, figure in Los Angeles sports history, both at UCLA and for the Lakers. And this was before he changed his name to how we know him today, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, of course. A picture of Marion Davies and Red Grange. Now this was in 1925. You know the real story behind this picture and it's fascinating because there's a lot more than meets the eye here. Right, it, it, it just looks like a, maybe a normal publicity shot of an actress and a football star, but uh, Marion Davies was William Randolph Hearst's longtime lover and Hearst in all of his newspapers and magazine, and, and Hearst owned, of course, the Los Angeles Herald and Herald Examiner. In all of his newspapers, he would use photos of Marion Davies and publish just to promote her movies and to publicize her career. And so this is sort of a typical shot that would have run um, to promote her latest project. And at the time, Red Grange was perhaps one of the most famous football players in the nation. Tennis, Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King, and until you told me, I was trying to figure out exactly what the connection was with California. Oh yeah, these are two of the great all-time athletes born and raised in, or raised in Southern California. Long Beach Poly High graduate, Billie Jean Moffitt at the time, but we know her as Billie Jean King. Bobby Riggs, Franklin High, uh, back in the day, back in the 30s, and of course, uh, Billie Jean King, a, a pioneer on the women's tour. Bobby Riggs, just an amazing player on the men's tour. And they were both had these amazing Southern California connections, which brings to mind the question that, that when you look through this collection, I don't think any other city or region of the country could have this many photographs dealing with this many stars who were literally local, you know, born and raised right here in, in this area. We're unique in that way. We're special. Um, we have athletes who were born and raised here, as you say. We have athletes who made their reputation here, somebody like Babe Didrikson at the 1932 Olympics. And we've had events that no other cities had. We've had two Olympics. We've had soccer World Cups. We've had Super Bowls. We've had World Series. No other city can match that. Were you surprised at what you found in this collection? Absolutely, absolutely. What I, surprised you the most? I don't mean necessarily which picture, but, but you know, when you started going through all this. I, 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 guess, I guess it would just be the breadth of, of our history here, the rich and diverse history. And the fact that the photographers, and, and this is a tribute to the photographers, they captured the times and they captured these people 
in their prime. And we may have forgot, we may not remember all of these people, but in their prime, these photographers were right there and they caught it at the moment of their glory, of the athlete's glory. Did you feel obligated to put this picture in the collection just because he's our governor now? Oh, of course. I mean, how many pictures are there of Arnold? But this is a great one in 1975. Yeah, it's a great one. And this is this sort of encompasses his early, his pumping iron days from, from that amazing documentary. And here's another one. Uh, well, this is just a... Just, uh, a bodybuilder. Yeah. That's, so you just kind of put that in to, to, to take care of the whole bodybuilding culture exactly. here in Southern California. Exactly. And, you know, the, the Arnold uh, image points to the fact that Southern California is part of this muscle beach culture and all of that. Um, and he was backed by all the people here, Joe Weider and, and his magazine and, and his people. Well, here's a muscle beach. I've met her before. Sure. Sure. This is uh, Pudgy. Pudgy Stockton, the queen of the barbells. And this was uh, the early days of, of Muscle Beach. I mean, she was part of that first crew with, with uh, Jack LaLanne and, and all the crew down there. Her husband, Les Stockton, and, and some of the others. Uh, and that was really breaking ground, too, at the time, wasn't it? That women were involved in, in some of these sports. Absolutely. Pudgy Stockton, a pioneer uh, in, in terms of fitness, and she had an all-women's gym and, and, and so forth. Now, here's another pioneer who I would not recognize her name, and a lot of these people's names are not household words, but this lady right here is very important to sports history. Absolutely. Uh, that's Eileen Eaton, and, and she's celebrating her birthday with a couple of or three champs and Eileen Eaton with with the help of uh, her husband and and some other important people in boxing ran the Olympic Auditorium and that was the capital of boxing and wrestling for Southern California for years yeah. it still exists of course and still fights are there but she was the the figurehead of that how many people do you think would would even know her name today I, well, just the boxing fans, just yeah. the boxing fans. So part of this collection also kind of opens up some history that maybe we wouldn't know about unless she had the pictures here. Yeah, long forgotten history. And, and some of these photos haven't seen the light of day since they were first published. All right, here's one I like, Mr. Moto, 1952. And there's a great story here that you've written about him. Sure, um, this is uh, uh, Mr. Moto, a wrestler, professional wrestler in the 50s. He was born in Hawaii, uh, was a sumo wrestler. Uh, after World War II, he, he and several others became professional wrestlers, and they were, they were the villains because, of course, after World War II, there was a lot of anti-Japanese and Japanese-American. And he played off that. Exactly. He, he, I think I remember watching him on television. Oh, I'm sure. He fought all over. Everybody and, would hiss and boo when Mr. Moto came yes. out. Yes. The villain. The villains are the, are, the, are the greatest. They make pro wrestling what it is. And the wrestling scene here is, is amazing from Los Angeles. Well, from Gorgeous George. Yeah, here's Gorgeous George, 1948. I remember watching him on television. Oh, exactly. I mean, he you, was talk about blending of Hollywood and the sports scene. That was it. Yeah, you couldn't take your eyes off of him. Uh, I mean, he dyed his hair platinum blonde, and he had his valet come in the room, ring and spray it with Chanel Number no. 5. So he was uh, quite an act. And here's one that is your boy talk about a setup, wonderful publicist picture here of Andre the Giant and Willie Shoemaker in 1982. Exactly. Now, what would be the the thinking behind putting together a picture like that? Was that a a newspaper gimmick exactly. to get readers? Exactly, exactly. And this photo was taken by a gentleman named Tio Eret. Uh, who's still around in his 80s, who was the Olympic Auditorium's house photographer. And this was a publicity shot for Andre the Giant, an upcoming wrestling show. And so uh, somebody thought of an idea, hey, let's put him, let's put the seven foot five guy with uh, well, the four like foot 11 guy and, and, and that'll be a fun shot and everybody will run it. And they probably they did. did, exactly. It was in the examiner. Exactly. Now here's a lady I, I wouldn't any, I have no idea who Lillian Copeland, circa 1929, but see, here's, a, th this is an example of how fleeting is fame, because today we, we don't know her name. Back then, I'm sure she, this was, this lady was a star, wasn't she? Oh, absolutely. Big star. She went to LA High and then USC and 
Um, you know, at the time, women athletes didn't weren't allowed to do a whole lot of weight and, and uh, strength exercises. And here she is, one of the first great throwers. And she set records in the shot put, javelin, and discus, and competed in the Olympics. And she went to LA High School and USC. Exactly. And, and she was on the first women's track and field events that were decided in Olympic history. Right. She won a silver medal in 1928. And in 1932, when the Olympics were here in Los Angeles, she won the gold medal. And uh, she's also interesting. She was a Jewish athlete, and in 1936, when the Olympics were in, held in Berlin in Nazi Germany, she refused to compete. Wow. So you don't know of her today, but in, in her time, both a pioneer athlete and, and someone with just a great spirit. See, I think, you know, this is, this is very, been a very poignant day because I I'm always have been fascinated and intrigued when I look at pictures of people, especially pictures of people who are long gone, who are not even with us, mm -hmm. and, and how fleeting. And if you don't know the stories behind the pictures, they're flat. Yeah. But if you know the stories behind the pictures, they come to life and they're so rich and they're so full. Like, I mean, who would have known about her not being at the Olympics in 36 because she was Jewish? Right. Well, it's, you know, there's thousands of those images that were here in the library just waiting to be looked at again. And uh, fortunately, we had the opportunity to take a look at them and dust them off and bring them out so the public can maybe get another look at everybody one more time. Boy, there's a treasure down here. Thank you very Thank you. much for your wonderful work in saving these pictures from obscurity, from those dusty old file cabinets and boxes, and bringing them back here to life for all of us to see and enjoy and be enriched by spending time looking at them. Well, thanks Thank for you interest. very much. Appreciate you coming by. We've had a wonderful time down here at the Central Library in downtown Los Angeles looking at this wonderful collection of photographs. The name of the, the collection is? It's play by Play, Century of Los Angeles Sports Photography, 1889 to 1989. And it's here for all of us to enjoy. Well, I sure hoped you enjoyed our visit down here to the Central Library in downtown LA as we visited Play by Play, a century of LA sports photography, 1889 to 1989, from the photography collection of the Los Angeles Public Library. And the good news is, is that this entire collection up here on the second floor, and then there are two galleries down on the first floor of the library, they're all filled with these amazing photographs, and they are open to the public for you to come down and see for yourself until March 27th of this year. So you've still got plenty of time to bring your family and your friends and your kids down here to see these amazing photographs from our past. And of course, we can also go online, and we're putting that on the screen right now, and see a lot of these images at home on our computers. So there are lots of ways that we can tie in to this amazing part of our sports history here in Southern California. Come on down to the Central Library and see it for yourself. Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation.